Let me start with the first of those myths, the robber baron myth. The myth that in the 19th century was a period in which the rich became richer and the poor poorer. That it was a century in which you had a conflict between Wall Street and the working man. That it was a period in which particularly the farmers of the Middle West were being ground beneath the rapacious activities of the Wall Street financiers in which there was widespread farm distress and misery. Now this myth had its origins in the 19th century. It produced the widespread greenback movement that you will learn about in your history books. A party uh, which at one time reached significant uh, size. A party devoted to the idea that all of the problems of the time could be solved if only the government would print enough of those nice pieces of paper which are lay a colored green on the back and which are called greenbacks. It was a period that also gave rise to the free silver movement. To William Jennings Bryan, the silver-tongued orator from North Platte, if I remember rightly, from these areas, who gave his famous speech uh, on the cross of gold in 1896 in Chicago at the Democratic Convention, in which he asked whether mankind shall be crucified on a cross of gold. A speech which got him the presidential nomination of the Democratic Party. And he subsequently was a nominee of the, Pres of the Democratic Party for several uh, subsequent elections. Fortunately, never elected. <laughs> that was a myth. What was the reality? The reality is that there is almost no period in human history which saw as rapid and widespread an increase in the well-being of the ordinary man as the 19th century. That was a period when millions of people from all over the world streamed to these shores. They came here with empty hands in the hope and the belief that they could make a better life for themselves and their children, and they succeeded. I suspect that most of the people in this room who are American residents and citizens today are descendants of the people who came to these shores in that period. I know to take the immediate local case, the Eccles family derives from a, 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 Scotch, a Scotsman who came to this country in the middle of the 19th century. I, uh, my parents came here in the 1890s from a part of Europe, which is today part of the Soviet Union, although at that time it was part of Hungary. And I suspect most of the people in this room have similar backgrounds. Now, do you suppose those people kept coming to these shores in order to be exploited? Do you think they came here to be ground under the heels of rapacious monopoly capitalists? Not a bit of it. A few people might have been led here under misapprehension. You conceivably could have had an initial inflow of people who thought they were going to improve their lot and ended up being worse off but you would not have had a continuing inflow. They would not have sent back to the old country for their relatives and friends. You would not have had a flow of millions upon millions year after year. And of course they were not exploited. They were not ground under the heel. They got jobs, they spread out west to the middle west, to the far west, to where we are now. And they made of what was a desolate country, a, a country that was prosperous and green and productive and improve their own lot. With respect to agriculture in particular, that was a period when the number of farmers increased. It was a period when the price of farmland rose. Now, of course, then as now, every farmer would have liked it better if he had done still better. What happened then, of course, was that the spread of farms increasing productivity, the development of machinery, the bringing under the plow of productive land led to a great increase in production which led to a decline in the prices of farm products. So it's true, the prices of farm products went down. But that was a sign of success. It was not a sign of failure. And the evidence that it was a sign of success was a rise in the price of farm land. After all, if this decline in the price of products had been a sign of failure, 
If it had been an indication that the farmer was being ground under the heel of Wall Street, why would people have been willing to pay higher and higher prices for the land from which those crops were produced? So the actual story is one of a great growth of productivity in agriculture, a great development of agriculture in this country. If we turn to the, uh, to the charge that that was a period of heartlessness, a period in which uh, the rich were willing to say, let the public be damned, as one man was quoted incorrectly as saying, if we turn to that charge, let me call to your attention that the 19th century, the period when we came the closest we've ever come to pure unrestrained individualism, a period when government spending, the spending of the federal government in Washington amounted to less than 3% of the national income, when essentially you had no restrictions on immigration and few restrictions on economic activity. Let me point out that that was also the period of the greatest flowering of charitable activity in the United States. That was a period when you had the establishment of so many independent private schools and colleges around the country. It was a period when the private non-profit Elemosinary hospitals grew and sprouted in every city in the land. It was a period of the Carnegie Libraries. It was a period of the founding of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. You name it, and you will find that the charitable elemosinary activities date back to the period of the 19th century. So the robber baron myth is a myth, one that should be deflated. It gets its appeal from a common fallacy, from the fallacy that one man's gain must be another man's loss. Of course it is true that many men became wealthy during that period. There were robber barons. There always are robber barons. People are people. Some are good, some are bad, some are in between. And of course, some people did try to mistreat other people. That is part of the course of history, unfortunately. But the main part of the story is that the process whereby some people became wealthy was also the process which opened up the country and provided opportunities for millions of other people to have a modest competence to be able to improve their own lot. It was the robber barons who, who were instrumental in building the railroads that joined the country together who were instrumental in developing the industries of this country and in thereby providing the opportunities for the ordinary man to improve his lot on life. Everybody can benefit. You can have some people become wealthy, not at the expense of other people, but by enabling other people to become wealthy. We had robber barons then and we have robber barons today. But there's a big difference between the robber barons then and the robber barons today. The robber barons then primarily could get their money only if people freely gave it to them. They got their money by selling a service, and nobody had to buy it. And if people bought it, it was because it was a better service than it was before. The robber barons today are in large part able to get their money by sending a policeman to take the money out of your pocket. Now that's a figurative expression, not a literal expression, but how do you become wealthy today? by getting government assistance. To mention only one very famous example, by getting government to assign you some TV licenses. <laughs> or by getting any one of a large variety of other, uh, of other sources of government support. If you look at where modern wealth comes from, it almost always comes from political influence which enables you to get benefits at the expense of the public at large. Now that is a zero-sum game. When the money is transferred from some to others through force and coercion in the taxpayer, then it need not be that the one man's benefit is also the other man's benefit. Then it can and often is that both parties uh, that the party who gains, gains at the expense of the party who pays. So robber barons will always be with us. The crucial question is whether we have a form of economic organization in which one robber baron 
keeps the other robber baron in check, or whether we have a form of economic and political organization in which one robber baron can help the other robber baron at the expense of the public. I want to turn to the second of these myths, the Great Depression myth. There is hardly any view that is more widespread than the view that some